Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Sass and uh, I would normally apologize for the hiatus in between my uploads, but that seems to just be a running gag on my channel, so I'm gonna stop giving a shit. Hey, did you know that there's a record-breaking heat wave hitting Texas right now? I know, it's because I work in it 12 hours a day, 5 days a week, and also my company went under. Not the one that I own, because I don't own a company. The one I freaking work for, so that's cool. Never you mind that though. I'm working on a 100% video for Donkey Kong 64, but the script is kicking my rear end. So, while I try to get my depressed ass off my couch to actually get the thing written, I figured I'd do a retrospective on Donkey Kong 64, which sounds like a really terrible idea because it'll really saturate my channel with Donkey Kong content. No. I will be doing many retrospectives in the future, but hopefully most of them are going to be a little bit less adrenaline filled uh, because this is just what I look like when I'm pressuring myself to get something done. So if you are if you if you're into that kind of thing, then by all means look forward to that kind of content. If not, I can always offer you a nice banana in this trying time. Has that, has that appeased you? Good. Let's get on to the video. Donkey Kong 64 was an ambitious project. Rareware were in their prime after releasing such hits as Battletoads, Donkey Kong Country, and Killer Instinct. With the jump from the SNES to the Nintendo 64 and the success of one of the greatest games and one of the greatest platformers of all time, Banzo Kazooie, it was time for the Donkey Kong IP to get the transformative treatment. That rareware touch that made genres swoon and players wet themselves in anticipation to get their hands on a copy. And in the winter of 1999, we got Donkey Kong's first foray into the 3D space. If you, uh, <coughs> completely ignore Diddy Kong Racing, which came out two years earlier, but Donkey Kong's not even in the game, bro! So like, Diddy did it first? Congrats, man. Freaking hated playing against you in Smash 4 and Day Escape. I remember getting Donkey Kong 64 for Christmas of 1999. I was four years old and didn't know the expansion pack the game came with was because Rareware made the freaking game too big, which is coincidentally why Nintendo didn't make much money on the game due to having to ship it with essentially more RAM for every single customer's Nintendo 64. Great foresight, Rareware. Good job. But none of that matters. We're looking at Donkey Kong 64 retrospectively, which is of course a fancy way of saying that I'm looking at it with future vision, or as many would call unfair expectations because games today are made with many more cautionary tales about bad gameplay. But that doesn't stop Telltale Games and Don't Yad from allowing you to walk around doing jack shit while the story moves along without you. So what even is a donkey? Kong. 64. Well, it's a collect-a-thon platformer with emphasis on large sprawling levels that are made even larger due to having multiple characters see and interact with the levels in different ways. The story involves King K. Rool showing up with a death cannon and an eye tick to commit a war crime on our favorite Kong. Chunky, I mean Donkey Kong. After Mr. Grumpy Pants stole the entire golden banana horde and kidnapped the other Kongs, Donkey Kong is tasked with retrieving his extended family of incredibly likable characters except for Lanky and regain his delicious golden bananas. The gameplay loop essentially boils down to you, entering a level, saving a Kong or two, and then gathering as much shit as possible before facing off the boss of varying dateability. If you wouldn't hold the shit out of Mad Jack's hand in public, don't even talk to me! Within each level is a smorgasbord of items to collect, like banana-themed currency, banana-themed bitches, and banana-themed bananas. If you didn't catch on, this game has monkeys in it? Kinda weird you also didn't notice my getup? You should really get your eyes fixed. Now I'm obsessive compulsive. I love collecting things, perfecting levels, and marrying every Fire Emblem character of suspect age. So the question is, is the core gameplay fun? And the answer is a resounding yes, with an asterisk next to it. Yes, running up a tower full of skeletons while collecting those potassium lace fun rods is a blast, but oh my god, is it ever tedious. I'm not against busy work, and by god, do I ever think that games should require a bit of time investment into them to be worthwhile, but this game is full of dead gameplay. The majority of your time spent scratching your head will be spent heading back to a tag barrel to switch Kongs because despite the fact that you're already in a place where you can do things, you're the wrong shade of monkey to get the task done. If another Kong's collectibles are in reach, they're transparent and otherwise uncollectible to your current Kong. So you gotta memorize where these floating tag barrels are to hop in, switch over, and head back to where you already were to do whatever it is you were gonna do. It's such a pain because I'm right freaking 
Dude, just let me grab it! Generally, the collectibles pop and are easy to recognize from a distance. Most of the time, you're looking at it like you look at a full parking lot at the grocery store you work at, silently wishing that you could just ignore the fact that it exists, but knowing not only can you not change your fate, it'll still blindside you anyway. A super cool hotfix for this would have been a simple quick change ability, but since this game is over two decades old, hack barrels were a thing in the series prior, and this is a retrospective that I hope makes me eat my words when this game gets remade, haha, <laughs> smile. I'll just leave it at that. One thing that I'd love to talk about is how this game handles movement. Every Kong handles a tad differently, but every single one besides Satan himself is so satisfying to move with. There's walking, walk attacking, long jumps, jump attacks, jumps. A lot of these can be comboed together to make moving from one place to another almost bearable. Literally, I guarantee if you play through the first couple of levels and you have nothing to do and are just aimlessly moving around, you'll find yourself going, excuse me, <laughs> till you wake up from your gameplay induced coma. Usually the camera works with you, but there are certainly times where it's more annoying than the flying enemies that exist solely to make your life a living hell. There's also a few challenges like this infuriating beetle that challenges you to races down a slope that stops being about skill and more about figuring out hidden game mechanics on the fly while being lapped at hundreds of times over until you finally get it right. The same goes for this race against this hare. Since you're using Lanky Kong, your time is gonna be spent trying to find a reason to continue living. No, you bitch! But Gravel can run faster than you? What the fuck does it even mean? Level design is actually really good. Jungle Japes is a nice tutorial level that's got a few areas close by to make the level seem bigger than it actually is. Frantic Factory has several rooms that are a blast to explore. Creepy Castle centers around a large castle. Shocking, I know. With a dungeon area that makes me want to shit my pants every time I'm there. And Gloomy Galleon. Actually, fuck Gloomy Galleon. Creepy Castle is actually a funny talking point. <laughs> What? Why is this game so scary? Like, as a kid, this game legitimately gave me nightmares. If it was intentional, then bravo! Like, duh. Creepy Castle is obviously meant to be terrifying. It's actually in the name, you silly goose! But other levels, like Crystal Caverns, have this terrifying moment that happens at random where this horrifying music cuts in as the cape literally tries to crush you to death. This area in Jungle Japes borderline turns into Jurassic Park's scary parts, but replace the dinosaurs with giant beavers, and Gloomy Galleon's boss is just scary regardless of how stupid he looks. Like, damn! Every cart section goes hard! Donkey Kong Country's minecart levels aren't this horrible horrifying why the fuck is that thing here it's so weird because the game's cutscenes go for a more zany and comedic approach and hell the ending is one long smorgasbord of slapstick humor gags the gameplay just doesn't match up vibe wise just listen to this clip if you go out of bounds with an ability <laughs> Like, what the hell, man? You're gonna give me an anxiety attack. I already can't call people to set up my own electricity. You think this is okay? Atmosphere is done so well in Donkey Kong 64, due in large part to the music produced by Grant Kirkhope. I don't know how this man does it, but the sheer range of emotion, environment, and character that his tunes add makes this game. I genuinely think if this game had any different music talent behind it, the experience would have felt like a downgrade. We go from your typical groovy jams of Jungle Japes to the more eerie yet whimsical ambiance of Crystal Caves. I still, after so many years after playing this game, still find myself humming like a tune or two from this game. It's really that good. Give the OST a listen if you haven't heard it yet. I've been going back to games I've grown up with and listening to their soundtracks at work, and I gotta say, I need a life. I need more free time to just vibe with the shit that I listen to. Speaking of vibes, did I actually talk about the level design or did I just mention it for like two seconds and then gush about the music? Yeah, I just mentioned it for like two seconds and then I discussed about the music. So levels are usually large, sprawling playgrounds to test out your Kong's abilities. Most of the level design complements the movement that the Kongs are capable of, and as you unlock abilities, it becomes instantly recognizably clear which Kong is required at each area within each level. For example, buttons are Diddy's thing because of his chimpy charge ability. Levers are Donkey Kong's thing because of his ability to pull levers. And doors and breakable walls are Chunky's thing because of his ability to respect your privacy by knocking but asserting his authority as the best Kong by coming in anyway. Golden bananas are sporadically placed in areas where some challenge is involved and usually properly tests your new abilities and rewards exploration. Like this golden banana surrounded by all this nasty green stuff that only Lanky Kong can get to because of his unnatural ability to inflate himself. 
just like a balloon. However the hell that works. However, something you'll notice after a while is that rather than a level being created in a way that provides a nice platforming challenge or a puzzle that tests your metal, these minigame barrels are overused and infuriatingly common. Minigame barrels are where golden bananas should be and reward Kong a golden banana for completing a minigame. Hence the name minigame barrel. Come on guys, keep up. There are quite a few minigame types and they range from literally how is this considered a challenge to oh my god this is impossible please gouge my eyes out. The minigames in particular are why I couldn't in good faith recommend playing this game on anything besides original hardware. See, Donkey Kong 64 is pretty unoptimized. The game runs slowly and there's noticeable lag in some areas. Since it's an old game, I can forgive this, but it's actually the laggy gameplay and the limitations of the Nintendo 64 that the game was built around. On consoles like the Wii U that can run Donkey Kong 64 with hardware that dwarfs its predecessors, lag is a thing of the past, and so is any semblance of balance in some of the time-sensitive minigames like Crazy Kong Clamor, where you're only given a split second to shoot the correct target and less than that on more optimized ports. It's pretty bad. Additionally, some of the minigames themselves don't even like function properly. The maze minigames require you to basically know the layout beforehand as backtracking even once usually leaves you with not enough time to complete the challenge. Petering Turtle Trouble is a joke since there's literally nothing keeping you from just constantly shooting watermelons to help these snakes stay hydrated. God, I cannot believe that sentence just came out of my mouth. And Beaver Bother. Beaver Bother. Beaver. Bother. Beaver bother just doesn't work. It does not work. You're supposed to spook these beavers into the hole in the center, but they'll literally just hang out on the edge of the hole and not fall in. It literally comes down to whether they feel like falling in or not, and it's genuinely such a bad minigame that it brings down the experience as a whole. Not to mention that in order to 100% the game, you have to play it three separate times. Two of them are in the same freaking level. <sighs> But collecting things is still a blast. Seriously, the dopamine rush of blasting open a banana balloon is something that mobile games have made their entire draw. It's a shame most things aren't actually tracked. So as I said before, I'm working on a video where I 100% Donkey Kong 64 and man oh man is it ever a head scratcher. While things like banana fairies, battle crowns, banana medals, and gold bananas are tracked in the game's menu, things like banana coins aren't? I can't tell you how often I'd need like five more colored bananas for a Kong and would just spend like an hour going over every square inch of a level only to find it in some bullshit place I never checked or overlooked. Here's what you want to do. Just hit any random number besides one. I fucking knew these coffins were full of shit. I knew these coffins were full of shit. A tracker or banana radar would definitely have been appreciated. There's also like a million trillion banana coins in the game. And if you're missing just a few of them, then good luck figuring out not only which level you're missing them from, but where in these sprawling levels they're even at. A tracker function or some sort of shaman kong that could show you a screenshot of where the next set of coins are would have been a massive, huge help. Plus, you know, actually tracking whether I've grabbed them all. This really only applies to people that like to 100% games like myself. So it's not that big of a deal, but I'm still going to complain about it because that's kind of what I'm known for on this decrepit site. Also, while we're talking about banana coins, wh why? Why, 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 why did there so many? There's almost a thousand in the game and you only ever need 160. It genuinely baffles me that there are so many collectibles in this game that genuinely do nothing. Banana fairies get you the final golden banana, so they're a completion reward. Golden bananas unlock levels and attribute much to the completion percentage on the file select screen. Banana medals allow you to earn the rareware coin after earning enough of them, so they're all right. And a few battle crowns are required for story progression and unlocking some multiplayer functions. But over 700 banana coins are borderline filler content that add nothing to gameplay and have literally zero usage. I am perplexed.
Still, if you're a casual player and just pick and choose what you want to do, a lot of these complaints aren't that egregious. It feels like the only people that the game punishes are people that want to play every aspect of the game. The bosses are pretty standard. You got your giant armadillo outfitted with war crime level of artillery, the aforementioned cutie pie mad jack, and a piece of fucking cardboard that somehow ends up being more terrifying than the dragonfly that can literally survive being dropped in magma. Unfortunately, the boss design is the tried and true formula of boss is invincible while throwing at attacks and then stands around waiting to get hit for no apparent reason. The only exception to this is Gloomy Galleon's boss, the horrifying giant pufferfish Puftos. You have to drive around and activate gates to summon pillars that shock the shit out of him multiple times. Why is it so terrifying? It's actually a fun boss battle after the drag that is Gloomy Galleon. It's just a shame you play as the cause of the Black Plague. The final boss is the culmination of Kong progression and where the zany aspect of the game ran up. After everything you've been through, King K. Roll challenges you to a freaking boxing match inside of his crocodile death machine. I love it. It's genuinely hilarious, and the longer the fight goes on, the more you tend to forget what transpired prior. Makes me wish there were more moments like this in the game, rather than having to walk from where the action is to a tag barrel times 100. The fight has you go through each Kong, using some of their signature moves to hit King K. Roll where it hurts. After the Titan falls, you can all breathe a sigh of relief. The slog is finally over. I remember Donkey Kong 64 fondly. Growing up, I remember considered beating this game a badge of gamer cred worth bragging about. Now, as an adult with a more refined sense of purpose, I still consider it so, though for different reasons. In terms of enjoyability, the movement of the characters, sans lanky, is something so fluid and enjoyable that just chilling while listening to Grant Kirkup's tunes and soaking in the environments is something worth playing for. However, the game is bogged down by missing gameplay elements like trackers for certain collectibles and a quick change switch that isn't location specific. There's also broken things like mini games that don't work alongside collectibles that literally do nothing. Though those will only affect people that focus on completely finishing games like myself. Still, for those who enjoy a chiller game with some time investment, Donkey Kong 64 is something I'd definitely recommend. If you want something like Banjo Kazooie on steroids without it being too much like Banjo Tooie, this is also a great pick. Just be prepared for some jank like needing to keep track of things yourself and subjecting yourself to a lot of tedium. Like a lot a lot of tedium. And that's Donkey Kong 64. For those of you who have played this game before, did I hit the nail on the head or am I a big stupid doo-doo head? Bars? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. Ignore the amount of cuts because I, I'm... I did not write this part of my script, so I have to come up with shit. For those of you who haven't played this game yet, do you want to now? Or does the presence of Linky Kong make you want to willingly ingest Ipecac? Nevertheless, thank you for watching all the way through to the end of the video. I'm now going to look right so that I can read out my end screen. If I could ask that you leave a like on the video to show YouTube that despite me only uploading every two months, my stuff is still worth promoting across the platform. I also have a Patreon in case you're feeling extra charitable, like this beautiful person here. Thank you so much, ATK Forme. I love you, man. You are beautiful, and you have a large PP. If you want to see your name over here alongside this beautiful guy, uh, toss me some dosh on Patreon, and then we can get cracking. Make sure to subscribe to my channel so you can stay up to date on the latest goings on at the Sass Jacket and the diverse content that I produce. I will lick your toes if you do. Uh, thanks again for watching all the way to the end of the video. I really do appreciate it, guys. And yes, I actually hired a hentai artist for the thumbnail art. And in the winter of 1999, we got Donkey Kong's first foray in four whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't say four A for some reason. Can I fucking help you? Hello? Yes? What do you want? Hey. Are you? What are you? Okay. Thank you. I guess. It's really hot in this costume. And that's Donkey Kong 64. And that's Donkey Kong 64. Did I knit? No. Oh. And that's Donkey Kong 64. Yep, that's it. Yep. Nevertheless, thank you for watching all the way through to the end of the video. And yes, I actually hired a hentai artist for the thumbnail art.